This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Jack, am I coming through okay? Yep. Thank you. I can. Okay. Uh, I'd like to convene the uh, August meeting of the Harwich Golf Committee and uh, thank everybody for attendance and uh, just a couple of footnotes before we start uh, with the agenda and the director's report. Uh, I'd like to welcome Paul White. Uh, we're going to cover that on the agenda uh, shortly. Uh, he thought he was retired, but uh, I, my arm twisting was successful. So welcome aboard, Paul, and uh, we're going to wait to hear from you in a, in a few minutes. Uh, also, it's available, people. Uh, The annual town report is available at town hall locations uh, in the community center. Uh, it's very informative. It has a recap of uh, the golf department's uh, submission uh, to that town report. And uh, although it's not gonna be accomplished today, uh, I, I really felt compelled to uh, bring this up. Uh, there was a great article in the Cape Cod Times two days ago about the difference between vision statements and uh, statements as far as organization is concerned. Uh, I'm gonna challenge everyone on the committee to uh, help develop a vision statement, uh, which is somewhat different than a mission statement. Uh, basically, I, I like to envision it as where do we see Cranberry Valley in roughly five years. Sometimes they project further than that, but uh, I'd, I'd like to try to work within that parameter of uh, five years. So uh, that's something that will be on the agenda for uh, the next meeting. So without further ado, uh, we'll go to the agenda and uh, I, I'd invite Roman to uh, share his director's report. Everybody has a copy of that on the PowerPoint presentation. Roman, you're on. Which, which ones are you going to share? The one, uh, one dated uh, July 28th or the one dated August 18th? August 18th. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, bear with me as I uh, initiate the screen share for this. Okay. Okay, Roman. Okay, how's that? Can everybody see that? It's perfect. Perfect. Okay. So I'm just going to go to my director's report here, and then we can bounce back out of this when you have another agenda item, Clem, and then we can okay. bounce back into it. Okay, you got it. All right, so we've got a lot to cover tonight, so I'll go through this stuff fairly quickly. Please stop me if you have any questions. So the Golf Now contract progress. I'm excited to say the contract is on the town administrator's desk for signature as of about an hour ago. So uh, it was awaiting a um, insurance certificate from Golf Now. It was the last component to the um, contract. So that should be signed, I'm hoping, tomorrow. Uh, and, and it's very timely. I, I think that uh, one point we got lucky with, I know this is dragged out forever, but um, we got lucky with that one in that we sold all of our tee times this summer. We had incredible utilization of our uh, public tee times, as you'll see later in the um, meeting. Um, and those tee times could have been sold at a reduced rate through Golf Now. We're getting into the off season now where we could really use some help selling some tee times. So I think it's very timely. It's gonna help us sell more tee times in the fall. So I'm, I'm, I'm as excited as ever for that partnership. Um, as far as the landscape project goes, I've got updated information on that too. 
I'm on the slide here. It says under the direction of the county procurement agent, we're getting four quotes this week. The company's on the county bid list. This is all being directed by our town engineer, who's also our procurement agent. And um, he set up today a on Wednesday, 826. We're going to have a walkthrough with four vendors from the um, county bid list. And uh, they'll, they'll be discussing uh, creating a catch basin paving, saw cutting the pavement to establish the new island, uh, curb berm regrading, as well as the hardscapes, the walkway, and the new wall that's required. So we're hoping that on the 26th, we engage some vendors and we immediately get some uh, quotes back. Um, and then as it says on here, once again, Sean Fernandez is gonna complete phase three of that, which is the plant materials, the irrigation and the lighting. Okay, Roman, can we stop there for a second? Does anybody yep. have any questions about the capital project? Anybody again? Nope, all set. Uh, one one thing, uh, uh, people that uh, I I believe I supplied everybody with. Uh, I I was successful in reaching out to Green Skies as far as the solar component is concerned. I I hope everybody saw that schedule uh, that they provided us with, and uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, a week from now, there thereabouts. Uh, they should be starting the initial phases of, uh, you know, solar uh, installation, and uh, that'll carry through uh, into September and October, uh, and it and it helps to trigger uh, other aspects of the project, the setting in place of the chargers, and and allowing us to uh, shop out the RFP for the carts, uh, as I see it. So, any questions there? Yeah, I have a question on the landscape project. Yeah, John. You know, the last time we met about four weeks ago, I thought that was in the process of getting done, and here we are four weeks later, and we still haven't got the bids yet. Yeah, that's true, John. This has been running slowly under the direction of the town engineer, and our, our I think really it's a hard project to run mid-season. You know, this requires Sean Fernandez is acting as a general contractor basically on this. And as I'll mention later in the report, this has been one of the most challenging seasons we've ever had as far as operating a golf course and um, maintaining the golf course. So this is happening slower than anticipated. I, I have a question. Clem? Yeah, go ahead, Jack. The thing you sent out said the um the target for completion was december 7th right and i assume the um based on on that uh, based on past uh situations i think romans indicated the the wiring is not going to be done until after the electrical is in is that correct roman yeah, so Jack, well, uh, you're you're exactly correct. Based on this uh, timetable that that's a little bit delayed from Green Skies, I've engaged a town engineer to request that um, his advice on uh, moving up the uh, charger grid. He really wanted to do the charger grid after the interconnection happened because that would, in, in his eyes, that would really give the charger uh, grid elect electricians something to plug into instead of just having dead connections awaiting the, the uh, interconnection from Eversource. But um, based on this timetable, I prefer to see the charger grid sooner than later. I go ahead and have them put it in there so when the interconnection happens, perhaps we can re-engage them to come back to actually finalize it. But um, they, when I saw that um, timetable, it, it's a little more delayed than what it was expected and what was originally planned. Um, I want to move up the charger grid uh, bid process. But do you have any commitment to do that? So I, I've requested that from the um, town engineer who's putting together the bid package, and I have not heard his advice yet back. His advice was to do a second, but I think based on the timetable, I've re I requested that we move it up, and I have not heard back yet. I guess the reason I'm hopping on this is, it, to me, it's not inconceivable that we won't have electric cots next year either. Well, that, that's, well that's, why I'm, that's the point I'm going to make to him. 
I mean, if the interconnection happens in November, uh, according to this plan, and the charger grid is in place, if the electricity is good, then, then the electricity is good to go in, in November, and we go with this. Um, but the schedule, the schedule at Clem Cloud said December 7th is who is done. Right. So I think if we have the charger grid in place and that interconnection happens by that date, uh, we're, we are good to go with plenty of time on the golf carts. I don't want to engage the charger grid after December 7th. So I, I do. that's what I reached out to the engineer to say. I think it's critical that we move up the charger grid ahead of the interconnection from Green Skies and Eversource. What, uh, okay, question on Eversource. Um, you talked about what the solar people are doing, okay. What is the schedule for Eversource to complete their work to connect so we can connect to it? That, that's, well, that's the final phase of what the um, solar team is doing is, is, is you're connecting with Eversource. So that all happens together. So someone's digging a trench, okay, and putting that stuff subterranean, okay, while this is going on, or is that after the fact? The, uh, this is all part of the Green Skies infrastructure, and then um, they're, they're putting it in, they're footing the bill for it, and uh, in coordination with Eversource. They've got a work order in with Eversource to coordinate their work together. So when we have the electrical stuff set up inside the cart barn, we're ready to connect. That, that means that Eversource should be have their work completed at the same time? Everything should be done. I know. Uh, when, when, when we hit that December 7th date, if that all goes according to plan, and if we have the charger grid in place, that should all be connected, or it may require one easy connection of what the charger grid electrician or electrical team previously did, connecting to what Green Skies and Eversource is going to have just completed on December 7th. I got my fingers crossed. You can't see them, but uh, believe me, I got them too. Man, unbelievable. We all do. Jeez. Okay, thanks, Roman. Okay. The next okay. topic in your report. So I'll, I'll keep cooking through this here. Uh, so when phase three began, um, we that was the return of league play, which I think has been very successful. Uh, great to see all the members out playing again and getting getting their guaranteed tee times on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, Due to the COVID crisis, we have a nice upgrade. We upgraded our Golf Genius software to do all electronic um, tournament administration. So that's from you know paying your fee to doing your scoring, um, live scoring. And when we uh, had the club championship the week right after the junior event, that was really cool that that was all electronic scoring. Uh, the leaders could see where they stood in comparison to other groups on the course, which is the first time ever. You know, usually it's post your score and then ask everybody how everybody else did. So it was very exciting. Um, I'll go over some quick scores from the club championship. Women's club championship was Jillian Dudek, 78-81. She won it by over 10 strokes. Men's white tee champion was Marty Clapton, 78-80. And men's blue tee, which is the overall men's champion, is Mike Richardson, 73-74. Won it in the playoff with a par on the uh, first playoff hole. So that was very exciting to implement the all electronic scoring through Golf Genius. And then um, um, as I move down the list here, um, hey Clem, you might want to mute everybody again. I'm hearing a lot of feedback. Yeah, I'm I'm doing that. Keep keeping my mic on if you can. Okay, and then as I keep going down the list here, um, these are items I was hoping to get committee's uh, feedback on. So we have had to cancel all shotgun events um, this season so far and all the way into the fall, basically due to the car limitations we have. The state mandates currently only riders from, the, the, the only case where you can have two riders in a car is people from the same household. So because of that, it just does not make sense to hold shotgun events, especially when one of the reasons you hold them is for the big banquet afterwards for good business for the restaurant. They're under such restrictions, they can't handle that kind of um, play. So we have canceled all of our shotguns through the fall, which I think is fine financially. I think we're gonna make out better. It's a, the restaurant's gonna take a hit because they, they really make out in those events. But when we have just normal days of selling tea times, we're actually doing better than when we have shotguns. My question I was gonna have is um, at least one of the, the events, um, which is the Bobby J, which is the uh, Harwich Fire Association. They really would like to do something for the Fire Association. So they've asked me if they could negotiate um, a day after 
Columbus Day, um, where they would have a Bobby J modified with tea times. And, uh, you know, I wanted to get the committee's ideas on um, what you think about me negotiating rates, because it is a committee policy that we've been following ever since I've been here, um, that is uh, charity, local charity events, pay half greens fee and full cart fee. So when we have events such as the Harwich Fire, Harwich Police, uh, Monomoy Boosters, um, they all, all are paying half of the daily greens fee plus a cart fee. Would you be, uh, would you consider um, me negotiating though that on a tea time day for such events? Uh, Roman, uh, absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, how about the committee at large? I would, I would approve. <laughs> I would too. Okay. I approve. And, and Roman, uh, just to make it formal, uh, what I thought was uh, we can bundle uh, your request into a motion, get it seconded and approved uh, as far as uh, this topic's concerned. Uh, you know, the charity rounds, I, I thought the Bob Miller request, uh, and there was one other thing as well. 10 minute tea times. The 10 minute tea times, yeah. So Great. Once, once we go through those topics, uh, if, if you're amenable to that, uh, I'll entertain a motion and uh, we can get it seconded and get that approved for you as a bundle, okay? I find that very helpful, thank you. I've got a so, question for Roman. Uh, you're, would, talking about, you're talking about negotiating the tea times. Uh, how, about, well, how, how about the cart situation? Are we gonna have enough carts? So yeah, John, when we run uh, tea times, we've been doing okay on carts. So uh, we, I could schedule a tea time event much better than a shotgun. Um, you know, it's like daily play. Um, we've only had really all season. We've probably had two days where we've had to run out. We, where we've run out of carts on really hot days. So tea times are much easier to handle the cart situation. And I could plan something uh, appropriately. Thanks. And really, we're only talking about a few events. Like I said, the Harwich Fire is the only one that's had the idea to do it. Um, in the fall, we have the Monomoy Athletic Boosters that normally do a fundraiser. We have the Pals for Life, which is, you know, local uh, restaurant charity. And um, that's all we have on the calendar still for um, charity events. So we're only talking a handful of events. Okay, Clem, I'll move down to the next one. So charity rounds. I appreciate everybody's feedback on this one because basically this topic is, I, I was given pretty wide latitude by the town administrator when I first started that um, I could give charity rounds to local fundraisers um, if they affected the local community in a charitable way, just that generally. And so I've given out Monday through Thursday foursomes to, uh, based on request, uh, you know, as, as they told me, non-discriminatory, I'm not picking some and not picking others. We've, we've done them basically across the board if they request, if it affects Harwich, the Harwich community in a charitable way. And uh, we have not ever been overwhelmed by these. And in fact, I think they're very good promotion for the golf course. It's nice for us to be involved in all these good events. Based on the incredible demand this year, I did not find it appropriate though to start handing these free rounds out when our members can't even get out, when we can't get enough paying public. So I've, I've just across the board stopped giving out the charity rounds and said, based on the incredible um, circumstances this year and the incredible demand, um, I'm unable to do charity rounds. I'd love to get your feedback on it because that's just a personal decision I made. And you know, I'm, way, I'm trying to weigh the black eye the golf course will take from this because you know, a lot of these charities rely on this for prizes and for fundraising, but uh, in the same token, I, I just didn't find it appropriate when so many of our members can't get out and so many paying public want to pay to play to give out free rounds. I'd love your feedback. My feedback is that I agree with you, Roman, that we should have no charity events this year based on the virus situation. Anyone else? Could these, could these charity rounds be given out in the fall uh, when, when demand is lower for the course? So John, what, what I normally do, and again, I can always amend this because like I said, I don't have very strict rules on these. I normally give them out with a, um, at least a year ex expiration date on them um, to, because a lot of times people that are bidding on this stuff that live off Cape, whatever. So, um, and you know, this is one of the cases, John, where so many of these don't even come in redeemed. People use it more as a way to give to the charity. 
So um, if we did it just for the fall, I think it'd be too limiting to the charity to, you know, I, I'd want to see it with at least a one year expiration date on it. Given that, I, I would support what John said. Regardless, this is an extraordinary year and we have to take extraordinary responses to these kinds of things. Okay, Jack Conley. Well, I'm going to need getting requests. It seems like most charity events are, are um, being canceled anyway. Yeah, I, I've got, I mean, I, I just very recently got one for the Knights of Columbus, which is from a member of ours. Um, I, I, I get them all the time for scholarships that, you know, affect local, local, local Monmoy students that are uh, applying for scholarships. So um, they, they go on throughout the year. Martha, did you have a question? I, I did. I, I wanted to know how many events usually we give um, a foursome. I mean, is it 20 or 10 or? If I had to guess, Martha, I'd say it was 20 to 25 in an in a average year. Wow. Okay. We, we, we probably see a dozen of them redeemed. A lot of them go unredeemed. Okay. Any other comments? Clem? Um, if I could. Yes. Um, Go ahead. Roman, number one, I, I, I support the decision you felt you had to make. I think it makes sense under the circumstances. Um, you know, but it is probably something that we should look to reinstitute when things normalize, if they ever do, um, because I think it is probably a very positive thing to do. But I think you should have the discretion to decide what's, uh, what's in the best interest. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Okay, moving on, uh, the Bob Miller request from. All right, very quickly, I, I think everybody found in the packet the request from Bob Miller. I thought it was incredibly fair. I don't see any re need to negotiate beyond what he offered, which is $2,700 for the season. That's more than just about any PGA pro is paying at a municipality across the Cape for a full season anyway. So it's a, it's, it's a good chunk to, to pay for a very limited season. And he is very limited this season. Uh, as he mentioned in the letter, golf instruction took a long time to get going this year. So I definitely uh, endorse the idea, uh, but I'd love the committee feedback. I agree. Very I agree. fair. I agree. I agree. Roman, Roman you're also going to consider offering something similar to Ron. Yep. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Jack. So. Um, I did the exact same thing after our last meeting. I reached out to both of them. Ron, in, in good faith, gave a $2,000 rent payment. So you go, went ahead and put a deposit down or an incremental payment for his rent for this year. And he said he would like to delay any type of um, request to the committee um, for rent this year until he sees how the season actually works out because he had no idea how to predict what the rent should, what would be appropriate to ask. So he's paid two out of his 10,000 so far. And he would like a little more time to um, see how things shake out before he makes a request. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And, well, if I can, if I can, Clem, I, this isn't necessarily appropriate. I got, I got to look um, and see what we legally have to do. But I think it was in that letter from Bob Miller. He's he's followed up with me also. He wants to immediately re-engage re for three more years, which I think would be wonderful. I, 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 um, I think that he runs a great program. He's got five different pros teaching for him right now. With my busy schedule, I haven't given a single lesson this entire season. I'm, I'm, I've just been so busy, I haven't given lessons. Um, our head pro, Dick, is booking two to three weeks out right now. So there's a ton of demand for instruction. Um, and I think Bob's team, with the five high-quality instructors he has, would be the perfect fit to just keep on going. They've, got, they've built such a nice operation at Cranberry Valley. I'm afraid it'll have to be a formal um, posted bid process, but uh, I just wanted to throw that out there at Bob's request. He he would immediately like to re-engage in talks for a, th a three-year extension or a, a new three-year contract. Yeah, that sounds great, Roman. Why don't you uh, why don't okay. we put that on the agenda for the next meeting and look at that timetable to have uh, you know uh, the request uh, made and and you know the formal aspect of it done so we can yeah. vote on. Good. Okay. So we can move on to the uh, uh, rest of the agenda, Rome. 
Sounds good. Okay. Uh, as as I Mark, indicated, you make a motion on that. You, we need to have a motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion then. Did we have a motion I, on that? We don't. We don't need it at this time, John. I want to cover the uh, ten minute uh, tea time intervals, and then we can bundle all three together. Okay. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, I included some of the materials. I know there was a carryover from the Board of July meeting, but as far as the consent agenda is concerned, uh, Mike Surgeon didn't have enough info uh, to put anything formally together. Uh, we'll have that in place for the next meeting. So uh, we'll move uh, tabling the consent agenda to- hey, Clement, uh, do you mind if I interrupt you for one second? Yeah. I don't mean to do this, I'm sorry. I had a couple of quick things I wanted to go through also that I, I just uh, had jotted down here. I wanted to give a brief maintenance update as part of my director's report. Okay, sure. Do you mind? Go ahead. Right. For very, very quickly, because I, I know maintenance is a really hot topic right now, and um, I'd love to just give the brief uh, synopsis. So for maintenance, it's been a very challenging season with a lot of play demands, a lot of heat, humidity, severe drought. We've had budgetary challenges limited the personnel personnel to the point where we only had our full staff back in the last week of July. So we've been very limited all season. I wanna publicly and formally commend Sean Fernandez, Rob Donovan and their staff for their exceptional hard work under the, these difficult circumstances. Um, as you even mentioned when um, before the meeting started, when you were talking to Paul, they were there Sunday night pulling a cart out of the water. I mean, they, they've been working like crazy. So I really appreciate their hard work and I think it, it should be commended. Um, the practices we're currently doing, once the club championship ended and the state tournament ended, it really, Sean prioritized um, giving some relief to the golf course because it was really under stress from all the heat and humidity. So we moved up our aeration timetable for fairways and uh, tees. Uh, we immediately solid timed the greens that, that next Monday. Uh, we are currently aerating the fairways and tees, kind of going a whole at a time. So tomorrow we're starting the sweeps on the back nine so we can Air eight fairways one, two, and three in the morning, and um, and uh, we're going to renovate the range tee next Thursday. Just aerate it and put down a lot of sand on it, and, and try to grow some grass back for uh, the fall. So, um, one, one final um, greens practice we're looking into. Sean's very excited with this um, process. I think he calls uh, grading, which he's looked into to dethatch the greens. He's excited to discuss this with the USGA agronomist on. Friday. So anybody that's there, he wants to really get their USGA agronomist take on this. But he thinks his biggest challenge day to day and season to season is still removal of thatch from the greens. So and that, that was always part of Jim Skorowski's report that the thatch was really the water retainer in the turf. So I think Sean's right on top of things in, in uh, researching and recommending some new processes and some new practices to help us uh, get ahead of the thatch issue. Um, and then really quickly, just some random items I wanted to mention, uh, just to show the, how different this golf season is. Uh, in the last two weeks, it seems like every day is a full moon. We've had a cart in the pond, a dog bite, a police, two police cruisers called for one member threatening another member, a formal member abusive staff situation. We have a neighbor, and think of our neighbors. Uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. We have a neighbor taking pictures daily and sending them to the health director claiming uh, health violations because he sees two people per cart, uh, not understanding that that's allowed when they're in the same household. And um, uh, we've had one of the AC units die, which I'm currently working with Sean Libby to try to get a price to get that back up and running. So it's a little balmy in the clubhouse. And um, the, all the budget restrictions we were under had us really tight with range balls, but with the new fiscal year, I'll, I'll discuss budgetary situations a little, little bit later in this, but. Uh, uh, it was a little hard to get our hands on range balls. The one negative, the only negative I could find with this junior tournament, those kids hit the ball so far, we lost more range balls that week. So we've, we've been really, if you see the, if you're at their driving range, chances are the pickers driving around and picking up the balls because we actually just go to get a load of, uh, I think 5,000 range balls in yesterday. So we're, we're actually good there, but that, that just shows there's a lot going on in the golf course. Like I said, it's like a full moon every day. It's been a little crazy. Most of these, um, uh, conduct issues have all been handled in a very civilized way with apologies after the fact, but um, it's been a hot summer and it's been a frustrating summer for people uh, that are trying to get golf course access day in and day out. 
And I didn't mean to interrupt you. I wanted to put that on the table. Uh, the next slide that I had on the, on the PowerPoint, Clem, was a, was a screenshot from Barnesville Golf's latest email to their members and Dennis's. And I thought it was funny because it echoes exactly what we're going through. It's talking about points, golf course demands, abuse of staff. So they, all these golf courses are dealing with the same things. It's just been a crazy season. Roman, and that's all I want to say. You, Roman, before you get to that, I'll, I'll, I'll continue with that. I just wanted to share that I spoke with one of the mass uh, uh, amateur championship officials out of the 14th fairway uh, during the championship round. And he, he, uh, and he said to me that he was very pleased with what with, with their experience at Cranberry Valley. I said, that's, it's unfortunate we're a little burned out. And he says, everywhere is burned out. So this is not unique. And um, they are really, really pleased with what with their experience here. So kudos to you and your staff, Roman. Thank you, John. I agree. I think we put a great product out there. And, and while when I'm saying the course is really stressed, yeah, it's 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 gotten you know we're probably less stressed than most because we have such a great uh, greenskeeping team. Okay, Rome, is that it? That's it. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that was fine. I, I'm glad that you uh, covered all those other topics. Uh, so people will quickly move uh, past the consent agenda. Uh, as I, I will promise that. Uh, uh, in September, we'll have minutes available for the aborted meeting and, and complete minutes, of course, of this meeting. Under new business, uh, I, a little bit formal, but I, I wanted uh, uh, to take a moment to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, the addition of Mr. Paul White to our committee. He is a resident of the town of Harwich. Uh, he has an extensive background, and, and Paul, uh, I, I'm not putting you on the spot, but if you'd like to make a a couple of comments, uh, uh, introductory wise, uh, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Clem, thank you very much. And um, it's it's an honor to join you and your uh, volunteers on the Harwich Golf Committee. And I very much appreciate this opportunity and I'm grateful to the selectmen for uh, responding to my uh, request for consideration. Uh, I think what I have to share with you is, uh, I, I, found, I think I found out I'm an affirmative action addition uh, to this committee uh, for high handicappers. Uh, so I'm, I'm here to represent those of us who uh, are high handicappers. Um, and just kidding about that, but yeah. it's, it's a joy to participate. Um, I had a nice experience Ooh. yesterday playing a very late uh, front nine at the course and uh, shared the nine holes with, uh, with a dad and his 19 year old son who he was trying to encourage to play golf. And, and the kid was a pretty good hitter for a new golfer. He's supposedly only been playing a month. And I was pretty impressed with his focus and how he was hitting the ball. But they were loving and enjoying the experience. And, uh, you know, my experience of playing at the course probably for close to 30 years um, is that everyone who comes there really appreciates the layout, the staff, the way uh, folks work to keep this as a, a gem for the town of Harwich. And, Whatever I can do to help the committee uh, to continue to do that, uh, it will be an honor. Thank you. Paul, thanks so much, and uh, welcome aboard. Uh, we look forward to uh, a, a long relationship. Uh, item number two, and now we can uh, uh, bundle uh, in a motion once we get through the topic. Uh, Roman, the tea time allocation uh, that you've outlined, uh, the possibility of 10 minute tea time intervals. Uh, if you could speak to that, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Clem. I put together a lot of slides. I can fly through these pretty quickly, but I'll I'll start with the the uh, my, my my recommendation, which is you know this pandemic's given us an opportunity to review our operational routines. Uh, we've always operated with eight minute tee time increments. It's a really aggressive plan. Um, the golf course really doesn't allow for us to have a good flow of the golf course with eight minute increments. Anybody who's played the golf course in the summer knows you make it to the fourth tee and you're, and you're backed up. So, um, and that's just on a normal day, never mind, you know, when it's really hot, um, when, you have so, when you're behind guest groups. Eight minutes is very difficult. So, you know, due to the COVID regulations, we've re really been able to see a much better way to operate and a much more pleasant. We've gotten so much feedback that it's just a much more pleasant experience golfing. Um, uh, the, the, with eight minutes, tee times, there's just too much congestion on the course, congestion on the course, and it makes flow impossible to maintain. So currently, the state regulation says 
you must ensure a suf sufficient gap between group tea times to allow for social distancing. I think we're doing that, and I think eight minutes that really doesn't do that because, I mean, once again, you're going to have that backup on the 4T that's just going to continue through the golf course. Um, I don't think in the long run eight minutes does us any good necessarily. So what I think, uh, I'll try to convince you with the research that I've done here, is that there could be a way if we finish the season with 10-minute increments for tee times, we show an increase in revenue um, because currently we are where we're, oh, we're utilizing our non-member tee times better than we ever have in the past. And a slide will show you we're outperforming last year with less non-member tee times. If in the rate and fee season this fall, we choose to, that we're going to go forward with 10-minute tee time increments and we're going to consider those premium tee times compared to our competition, I think it gives us the opportunity to outprice our competition. And then some of the slides coming up will show what the USGA says about this. But, you know, can we raise our greens fees $10 across the board if we're offering a four-hour round at any point in time? I know that's hard to say because, you know, coming out of the hot and humid days of summer, there were some days where we still, even with 10-minute increments, had some slow play days. But in general, we've had a much different experience on the golf course. If it turns out we can charge a premium for those tee times, I think that this, the end result could be more member tee times because in the, a smaller amount of non-member tee times, we'd be able to pay the bills, allowing for more member tee times. So, you know, by ex expanding the increments, possibly we could expand the member tee times as well. If, if it's a plan. So that, that's, that would be my suggestion. And um, as I go through these slides, um, I'll, 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 I won't read through them because it'll be pretty long, but I'll hit the highlights. Thank so the, the USGA had a pace and, and innovation symposium to find out the financial impact of pace of play. They did this in 2016. I picked out a few items on this. Basically, when they spoke with golfers, they found out that speed of play it's the number two factor when, when choosing a golf course to play um, behind course conditioning. I think we're all pretty fairly confident that our course conditions are, are regularly very, very fine compared to our competition. So, and speed of play, when you talk about pace of play, the most important factor is the tee time increments to pace of play. Um, when they ask golfers, will they pay a premium to pay a, play a faster golf course that has a better speed of play, most golfers would pay on average 9.1% more, more money in greens fees to, pay, to play a golf course where it was a speed of, speed of pace of play. Now this, this slide right here just uh, speaks to what demographic and golfers over the age of 60 are less likely to pay more and younger golfers are more likely to pay a lot more. But I think if we just look at the average, average golfers, our average fee, fee paying public we would be willing to pay more money for a better experience and for, you know, I wouldn't say a guaranteed four hour round, but a much better flow on the golf course. This I think is a very important um, slide here and it breaks down golf courses that have seven minute, eight minute, nine minute and 10 minute increments. And if you look at the bottom of the chart there, it says peak season, weekday, weekend utilization of the golf course. Look at the 10 minute increments. They, they, they have much better utilization of their tee times in both non-peak and peak season. So, you know, this data says, and I know we're in demand. I know, I know we're not the average golf course that's empty and not in demand, but when you have 10 minute increments, you're more in demand. And I think once again, that leads to um, charging a premium. Um, so this is from the Royal and Ancient Pace of Play Manual. And basically it, it says, um, if starting intervals between groups are too narrow, it will result in too many groups being on the course at any one time. And as such, adopting all or any of the other recommendations in this manual will be futile. It's basically saying, take pace of play and throw it out the window if you don't have optimal um, increments of your tee times. You know, we could do anything in the world to push golfers around the golf course. If we're using eight minute tee time increments, we're fighting the battle we've always fought, which you know, a lot of these committee meetings in the past have turned into discussion of five hour rounds. And I, I think our staff has done a great job with everything we could actually do with the eight minute increments, but um, it's, it's, it's not providing the best uh, experience we can. Um, and then I'll go through this even more quickly. Okay, so this, this I'll go through very quickly these next couple slides. Part of this uh, study showed a sample golf course that had a par four, a par four, and a par three. Very similar to our golf course where we go 
par four, par five, par four, and par three. They studied the golf course in eight minute intervals and 10 minute intervals. And if you look at this chart here, it basically breaks down to the, uh, with eight minute intervals, by the time the group made it to the second, uh, to the third tee, they already had a one minute wait. By the time the third group made it to the third tee, they already had a two minute wait. Whereas with the 10 minute tee times, you have the, the key word and pace of play is flow. You had flow where there was no delay at all. I think that's what we're looking for is to have enough spacing so that when our groups hit that fourth tee box, there's not that regular stop. They just keep flowing through. So, um, and here's just a conclusion to say um, that basically for, this was from the Royal and Ancient Manual as well that says, as outlined in the manual, even if alteration of the starting intervals does reduce the number of players that play a course on any one day, the experience of those who do play is positive. The likelihood is that over an extended period of time, more golfers will wish to play the golf course. In addition, those people will be prepared to play, pay slightly more knowing that they're guaranteed a pleasurable experience. So that's what I was speaking of. With good intervals, I think we can charge more to our paying public. And by doing that, I think we can justify a higher percentage of member tee times at the end of the line, accomplishing two goals. Roman, question for you. Uh, right now we've got 1,100 plus members um, yes. of Cranberry Valley. And if we stay with, uh, 10 minute tea times and we charge a premium because of the condition of the course and all the and 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 the better the, the better experience if you will do we have any sense of the uh uh i'll call it elasticity of demand how many people will will, will not join and that 1100 make drop to nine any sense yeah. of that at all yeah so i mean boy that, that's a tough one john because this year is so incredibly unique i think we'd have a better sense on a normal year this year is so incredibly unique. If if next season there's no so you know there's no such thing as the COVID crisis and beaches are open and restaurants are open and museums are open and we're kind of back to normal and where where our members are doing their regular summer travels they normally do, uh, they're not working from home any longer. There's so many factors that have the same number of members we've always had yeah, yeah. wanting to play a lot more golf. I mean that's what we're facing right now is the same number of members. That we've always had the same number of tee times we've always had there's so much more demand for rounds and um this this chart right here shows it that um you know currently if you look at the chart on the left the eight minutes and the chart on the right 10 minutes you could all you could change those two numbers to 2019 and 2020 because that basically the eight minute tee times was last year and previously and so we've altered the distribution from member tee times to non-member tee times you know, last year on weekends we were doing 50 50 we're currently doing 60-40, which makes 144 golfers, uh, mem member golfers, can play on the tee sheet every weekend day last year and this year, same number. What we ended up dropping in was the weekend guest rounds because we shrunk their, their tee time increments, in, uh, their, their tee time allotment in order to satisfy more member play. Same thing on weekdays. We're now doing 70-30 breakdown other than Wednesday. Wednesdays, because the sweeps are doing more of an 80-20 breakdown. And, um, You'll see the potential weekend green fee revenue is has gone down about three thousand bucks, and the potential weekday green fee revenue has gone down not quite three thousand bucks. So when I was first preparing this, I was preparing to, you know, present this to say, I know we're losing money doing it, but maybe in the future we gain. Here's the facts. This is this is the green fees collected um, in July, and I only did this one snapshot because once again we're comparing to the tornado last year, so. This basically goes from the start of phase three comparison to right up before the tornado struck. And I, I didn't want to do any August breakdown because the tornado had effects still through August because even when we reopened, we were limited. Um, there was, you know, it was hard to sell tea times because we hadn't had a tea sheet to sell, not knowing um, when we would reopen. But what you'll see is we're, we're having much better utilization of uh, tea times, um, whereas our potential was 10,000 and 8,000, and we only realized. 5,100 on average. Right now, we're we're exceeding that with, with a much fewer tee times. So, I think you know. Once again, this is a unique year. There's incredible demand. I don't expect this demand all the time. But if we're putting out a good product, maybe you know, in the post-COVID days, um, some of these golfers will stick, and they had a great time at Cranberry Valley, and they'll be willing to pay them a, a premium to play here. Um, Have you, Roman, uh, on the 10-minute tee times of uh, this. Uh, shows the reduction in revenues. Has is is any of the, at least conceptually, been shared with the town and what's their reaction? Because we're, we generate revenue for the town. 
Yeah, so I spoke with the uh, I speak with the finance director quite often on the subject, and um, we're outperforming. We're, we're we're by far outperforming expectations due to the crisis. Uh, they, they thought we wouldn't make our regular revenue numbers, and if you see on the the left chart is the 2020. We're in green fees. We're exceeding a normal year, so we're actually making more in green fees with less tea time availability than we did in a normal year. So uh, they're, you know, I, I wouldn't want to put words in their mouth, but they're. Um, I'd say they're thrilled with our return this year. And it was, uh, speaking with the finance director, uh, if you watch any selections meetings, she all the time mentions golf and how we're outperforming expectations. If, uh, if you're going to comment, raise your hand just so that I know and I can keep the, you know, the echo chamber down to a minimum. Anyone else with a comment? Uh, John Crook. I'd say we make a motion. Okay. John? I make a motion that we accept Roman's recommendation in terms of going to 10 minute tea times, that we have no charity events for the remainder of 2020, with one exception, which is the Howitch fire uh, outing that you're going to have after Columbus Day, and that we accept Bob Miller's lease arrangement for 2020. John, thank second. you very much. Second. I need a second. I second, second. that motion. A second from John Wheeler and uh, discussion. Uh, Jack Conley. Okay. Uh, Con, I just thought I heard Roman mention there were three or four groups that were having charity events. Is it only one Roman? Yeah, so you're exactly right, Jack. So I've, I've been engaged by one group only that wants to negotiate a tea time option. But uh, there, there are two more events, the Monomoy um, Athletic Boosters and the Pals for Life that may want to. So if, if you wanted to give an opportunity for me to negotiate with them, if that opportunity comes up, um, I would please include that as well. Yeah, I, I wouldn't personally, but um, I think, I think you're, you're going to run into an issue of how many is the, is the, um, is the, is the impact of this on the tea times. I mean, that's three, that's potentially three more days of, of less tea times for the members. Uh, Roman? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I heard the question. What's that? No, I said if you, I have no issue, I guess, with one, but if you're going to expand it to three, but I know PALS is a large channel, and they typically had 144 people in the past. And I don't know how big the fire, the fire is, but uh, the the um, the PAL was a pretty big tournament, and, and you're taking away the tea times from the members with those events, or I assume you would be. Yes, yeah, so I, I, you're absolutely right. So um, what we're talking about for the firefighters would be a much smaller event because they would not have the the numbers that they would normally have in a shotgun event. I don't think the Pals for Life event really um, um, would work very well with tea times. But once again, I, I just, all I wanted to do was to have, have the uh, uh, committee's um, authority to negotiate it if there, if there was something there that was workable. Um, and then Monomoy Athletic Boosters, that's an important event, obviously, for them to raise money so for, for the athletics. So. I'm not, I haven't engaged them yet either. I've engaged both groups to say shotguns are not, a, not allowed this year. We won't be able to hold them. So, uh, so far those events are completely canceled. Um, there's no need necessarily to negotiate with them. I, I was just asking to keep the door open in case there was an opportunity. Martha? Go ahead, Martha. Just go with the one with the firefighters. I would not engage in the other two that have been much bigger in the past. And I think you're opening up the door to have other groups who want a small fundraising event that you would have to negotiate with. I would just say one. Point well taken. Anyone else? Uh, Paul White. I thought I heard Roman indicate that if he went with the system of scheduled tee times versus shotgun, 
that that it would be possible to handle it. And I don't know if that puts a different spin on the idea of having more than one, but I just wanted to at least raise that point and see if that would make a difference. Uh, Roman? Yeah, so, you know, once again, I, all, I've, all I've discussed with these groups in the past is, is or up to this point, is that they're canceled. Um, as, he, as I think Jack mentioned, the Palace for Life is our largest shotgun of the year. It's 144 people. It's closed all day for that event. I'm really not anxious to um, engage that group. This, it's not really a golfing group uh, with a tea time event for 144. Um, I was thinking more along the lines of if the uh, Monway Athletic Boosters wanted to have a fundraiser for t with tea times, much along the lines of the um, of the uh, Bobby J uh, Harwich Firefighters. I would you know consider that. And once again, the Harwich Firefighters are about 100 to 120 every year. I think they're thinking about about 50 for tea times because it's it's, it's a different time of year. It's a, it'd be a smaller group, not because there's no shotgun. So I think we're looking at much modified events is what we're discussing here. It's a much smaller impact. But again, if he, if you wanted to pull out the pals for life, I already told them we're canceled, and I'm not. That's not the kind of event I was really looking to pursue. Uh, so that's fine. But um, the Monomoy Athletic Boosters, I think um, I'd ask that we keep the door open just to see if they want to raise some money for their athletic teams. Any other uh, comments? John, could you repeat uh, the motion, please? We have, that we have no charity events for the remainder of the season 2020, with two exceptions. One exception being the Howard's Firefighters, and one leaving open a tournament with the Monomoy Athletic Boosters, in that we accept Bob Miller's lease arrangement for 2020. Okay, uh, I believe we're ready for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Right. Raise your hand, please. Okay, it's uh, unanimous as I uh, review the vote. Is that correct? No abstentions? Thank you very much. Roman, I hope that uh, uh, helps you uh, moving forward. Thank you very much. It certainly does. I appreciate the thoughts and I appreciate the motion. Okay, uh, number three under new business. Uh, it's kind of coded language, a response regarding the concept of partner town and Chatham memberships. Folks, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, the chairman of the uh, Board of Selectmen uh, brought to my attention, uh, and Romans as well, uh, the fact that uh, there had been several complaints about our relationship with Chatham, what it represents, what the various membership categories uh, are as far as, uh, you know, we've uh, outlined them uh, from year to year and, and what the implications are uh, going forward. I supplied with you uh, a letter uh, that I referred to as the Chatham letter. And uh, just to clarify, According to what Roman has shared with me, this individual and two of his family members, direct or indirect, within this family unit have promoted, uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, angst with the selectmen, insisting that we've headed in the wrong direction. It starts out, hi, Larry, I'm writing to express concern with the current situation at Cranberry Valley Golf Course. In short, it's been difficult to get tee times. We now have, and, and I'm, I don't want to read the whole thing because I know you've We've got a copy read. one. Huh? We've got a copy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, the letter itself is uh, fraught with uh, innuendo and there are numerous uh, inconsistencies and inaccuracies. And I'll point out one that I spotted because I, I still am confused about it. There's a reference to resident taxpayers picking up a $500,000 deficit. I have no idea what that means. And, and that's why I want to open this up to a uh, discussion. And uh, it, as a result, I, I'd also like to 
uh, you know, take some action from uh, from our committee uh, to address this individual, so that we can, uh, you know, allow the selectmen to do their business and not be micromanaged by a a, a micro, uh, actually a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of members, uh, you know, as far as this issue is concerned. So I would like to open it up for discussion, uh, and I'll try to, uh, you know, the, uh, move as carefully what's the, as I can. Yeah. What's, the, huh? what's the gist of what this person is asking for? Uh, Roman? Yeah, so um, I'll give you a little background very quickly. I've had to um, address three separate formal letters to the selectmen. The selectmen have asked me to answer all three um, and copy them on the answers. And I'm sure there's discussions going on that I'm not included on, but these were all three members of the same household, like Clem said, a, a brother, a sister, and a brother-in-law. Um, and in general, there's a lot of taking stabs at different parts of our operation. What they've really nailed down on is the chat and membership. They, they've, in certain letters, they've said they think it's illegal that we offer a special deal to Chatham. And now, the one thing that I, I would give a little sympathy to, because I know where this is coming from, tea times have been incredibly under demand uh, this season. And so this is coming from Harwich residents that can't get tea times and are having a difficult time getting tea times. And they think that, you know, our over 200 Chatham members are taking their tea times. And, and, and they're not offering us, you know, shellfish licenses at discounted rates and all these other things that they list in their letters to the selectmen. So um, that's the gist of it. They want to, this particular person is championing uh, getting rid of the Chatham discount. Uh, Jack Conley? Yeah, I, I've been in copy on some of his letters, or some, some of the individual's email. But one, one of the issues, uh, Roman, and, and to me it's, it's really a, a fundamental issue, according to him, you know, what is the latest thing? He mentioned that there was a $500,000 deficit that the golf course is operating on. And, and when I replied to him about that, he indicated that he's been told by the Finance Committee that the, the unspecified costs that are associated with running the golf course, like benefits, medical insurance, so on and so forth, um, are amount to about $800,000 a year. Yeah, I can address that, Jack, because um, I spoke with the finance director yesterday about this specific topic. Um, that exact email went to Ed McManus, our liaison, who went down to yeah. the, and had a meeting with the finance director on Saturday, I believe, Friday or Saturday. And uh, they found no merit to what his claim was. You know, I, I think I provided this committee last year with a spreadsheet that showed, you know, when you apply the golf course debt, when you apply the um, the, the old debt, we're, we're taking care of any new debt we've taken on in the last decade. But there's debt still from 2007 and 2000 that's coming off the books in the next few years. When you apply that debt and the, some of the employee benefit type items, I think that spreadsheet had us at about $2.1 million, and we brought in, I think, last year, 1.895. So that does have us a little underwater. But once again, uh, his claim is that we're an enterprise fund, and, she, and uh, Carol, the finance director, very quickly explained, uh, no, we're a cost center for the town. We're a town department that's a cost center. Um, so you know, we're, what we're expected to do is cover our, our direct budgetary expenses and a portion of our indirect expenses. So uh, but, she, found, she found his claim to have no merit. But if that is true, that we're, we're really three, maybe $300,000 not covered, I, I think that's a big deal in this time and in this, in, in this um, the attitude in the town. I, 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 you, you saw what happened last year at the town meeting with the um, ability to do um, World County Road. They, should, they voted that down. I think we're going to run into similar situations on, um, in our environment if, if we're looking for more funds from the town. Well, I, I don't think we need to be transparent as possible as far as what is this 
you know, as a taxpayer, I, I think we ought to know what is the cost to have this golf course in town. So, uh, Jack, I, I have these conversations quite regularly with the tech finance director, and uh, you know, well, what if I I don't I, I'm not comfortable putting her words in my mouth, but what I generally get from her is the golf department pays more of its own end than any other department in town does, and, and it pays far beyond what our current share would be. Now, when we um, there's a significant date coming up, and I'll, I have a little information on a later um, agenda item about this, but um. We're in the next year or two from getting about $150,000 of debt relieved from, from past, I think, the building of the clubhouse, if you can believe that. That's about to come off the books and then the irrigation renovation. So that's going to bring $150,000 off of our debt to the point where we will be debt free, um, non, notwithstanding the car farm we just built, which we're funding, that we're funding that debt. So I think we're pretty close to break even and the, and the finance director who in my eyes, you know, she's part of the financial team directly right under the selectman. She's very comfortable with our position financially. But, but I'll... I don't think that has been stated to this individual in the, in the response in the letter. At least I didn't, I didn't see it. Um, but you know, be as, as candid or as direct or as transparent as, as we can regarding, you know, are we making money or, or, or is it costing us money? Well, that I think. I mean, all right, but I, I think that uh, her response that she gave to me the other day is, "What what we are is uh, we we are not an enterprise fund. We are a cost center for the town. So that we're a cost center for the town that pays most almost its entire bill." And but 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 um, we we cover our direct expenses and most of our indirect expenses, and the, the town from all indications I'm receiving from the finance department every year when we get our budget approved and from the finance director is we're doing we're covering an, an appropriate amount of our bill. I'd like to hear from uh, other members as well, and uh, let me just interject this, Jack. A lot of a lot of what I read into that letter is repeated rumor and innuendo. Uh, this gentleman is just flat out incorrect about the realities of our financial position as a golf operation. And if anything, we return an excess of uh, money to the town after all expenses. I've heard that rumor for the last 10 or 12 years. All the fringe benefits, everything's included when it gets expensed out and the bottom line is reached. So uh, other comments from other members? John Crook. Well, I mean, uh, this has always been one of my pet peeves that, you know, obviously we run Cranberry Valley, we've got to run it as a business. And when you take a look at the revenue and subtract what our costs are from an operation, we're returning to the town, the general fund, on an average, anywhere between three and four hundred thousand dollars a year. So I think we're certainly doing our part to cover any debt that we have to the town. Uh, my other quick response would be based on I took a look at the uh, rough draft that Roman had uh, put together to this individual that was complaining about the tea times and the Chatham membership. And personally, this is my own personal opinion. I think we're spending way too much time with this individual. I would not give him a letter that detailed in terms of what's going on right now. I would basically tell him that the golf committee discusses these topics on an annual basis. Uh, tea times, obviously we've had a discussion on that today, but tea times are part of that discussion. The membership rates and fees are part of our discussion that we have every fall you know, for the coming year. And uh, really, when you go back to the history of what the Chatham membership has been, that was really predicated on feedback from the selectmen. And we always kind of fought that a little bit in terms of the differential between Howitch and Chatham being none, really. And we always thought there should be a differential. But we certainly discuss that every year at the rates and fees meeting. So. Personally, I would just say that uh, the golf committee discusses these topics on an annual basis. That person is certainly welcome to come to that meeting in October 
when we discuss rates and fees, memberships, Howard, Chatham, East Ham, Orleans, non-resident, whatever the case may be. So I just think we're giving him way too much attention with this particular letter. And once again, that's my own personal opinion. I'm sorry hey, about John, that. John, I tend to respond to that. Um, that you know, I used this letter. This this was uh, the the town selectman, uh, in particular Larry Valentine, asked me to respond. So I used this letter to, as a springboard to highlight what we're doing and to to you know I, I use it more to explain to the selectman what's going on than than this gentleman. And I did hear that the the response that came out of uh, Ed McManus and um, the finance directors um, meeting on Saturday to discuss the finances and the merits. What he said. You know, they, they both, I think, are kind of along the lines of what, you, what you're saying, where they, they're, they're, um, their response was, at some point, you got to tell them to go find another golf course, because he's, he's just looking for trouble here. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll take uh, in order. Uh, uh, John Wheeler, I saw your hand up. And okay. uh, John, if you would. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm looking at the, at the, at the correct letter. But it talks about, I looked in the particular situation you mentioned, and see that you have not played a weekend, Friday or Sunday round since June 20th. But then, then you said your six rounds played over the previous 14 days do hurt your priority. My initial reaction is if he played six rounds over two weeks, I don't want to, I don't want to hear about this guy. Hey, John, he played 18 times in May. We opened, we opened on May 10th. He played 18 times for the, uh, just about every day in May. And when I, I wrote John, this letter, he was, when I wrote this letter, he was at 30 rounds. I think, I think John Crook is right on, right on with this guy. Uh, Steve Bellotta. Steve. I, I, I agree with, I agree with John as well. And, and, and the other members that have said that I, I mean, when I read it, what, what, my sense was, and this is just one's person impression, one one person's impression, is that uh, this family is is questioning why we are giving the discounted, if you want to call it, rate structure to Chatham people, and and I think that's the root the the, the root of of his frustration, and for whatever it's worth, it's a frustration for me as well. I mean. Cranberry Valley is owned by the town of Howitch. The residents of Howitch deserve the best break we can give the taxpaying public in the town of Howitch. For the life of me, I can't figure out why, other than history, we should be giving a rate that's different for Chatham than it is for other towns like Orleans and East Ham or anybody else who isn't a taxpaying resident of Howitch. And I don't, I'm not suggesting that we jump all the way from the current rate structure to, to match the East Ham one or the, or the non-Howitch ones, but I think we should have a strategy of moving towards that. There's no reason, logical reason that I can think of other than history, that Chatham should be afforded the benefits of a rate structure that's similar to the taxpaying public in the town of Howitch. In my, uh, I'm going to take take out of order a bit because uh, I haven't heard from Martha John uh, Wheeler. Uh, Martha, would you like to say something first? On mute. Steve and John Crook, I totally agree with what you say, and I feel very much the same way. And we're not the only ones. I mean, there are so many members, particularly I think this summer because of the virus and the limitations on tea times for members. But we have discussed this at every single meeting in the fall. And we make the recommendations to the selectmen and it's the selectmen that have chosen to choose Chatham as almost an equal to Howard, and it goes back to, it can go back to the you know, you, the schools becoming united. I, I'm not really sure why we chose Chatham, but the selectmen for some reason have. So I think that the only thing that we can do is make our recommendation in the fall that there is an increase in Chatham's dues. 
um, so that the members know that we're listening to them and are responding. Thank now, Clem, Clem, if I can mention, you know, we made that decision last year and we did create a separation last year with the idea that we would continue that separation to extend that separation. So last year was the first year that Chatham paid more by we increased it by $25 with the intention to do it again this year to make it 50. Exactly. Uh, John Wheeler. I was just going to, uh, to, to build on, on Martha's comments. I think that as, as I said, when we had went through this discussion last fall, I think that this move was a symbolic move um, to uh, tell the town of Chatham that we're still interested in this, this regionalization when it comes to, as you say, schools, Martha, or when it comes to the sewer um, and other potential partnerships. And this is like an, uh, it's like a, um, um, uh, an offering, a, a peaceful offering to them. Uh, I'm not crazy about it either, but you know, so, see it as it may. So. Okay. Uh, could I just uh, humbly suggest that uh, we, we don't want to digress too far. We're, we're dealing with a, a tiny component of membership. They have addressed the selectmen. We are addressing this topic. I'd like to take some kind of action to, uh, you know, address this individual's concerns. I'd be glad to put it in the form of a letter with everyone's approval, if you think that's appropriate, because the bottom line is, this is the way it is this year. We are not going to give this individual a, an accommodation that other people would not be able to uh, take advantage of. And uh, if that's not satisfactory, there are a lot of other playing options for that individual uh, that he could pursue. So I, I'm just interested in your ideas. Otherwise, we can, you know, move this off the table and go to the next uh, topic. But uh, I think the selectmen would appreciate uh, some kind of action uh, by us. In fact, this morning, I, I was uh, notified that this individual at 7.15 this morning had issued yet again another email complaining about a tea time that he did not get. It's it's ridiculous. He emails the selectmen every single time he gets waitlisted or overflowed. So anyone, uh, how would you like to respond, or what action would you like to take, Martha? Or make it short and sweet. You don't give them too much information. Just keep it short. Okay. Uh, could you repeat that, Martha? That we lost the front end. I'm sorry. I agree with what John Crook said. I think we should not give him so much information. I would make it short and sweet. Thank him for his input that we have discussed it at the golf committee, and we will discuss fees and dues in the fall. Period. Uh, could you put that in the form of a motion, Martha? Um, could I turn that around and say this is my motion? That I think that we should respond in a very short, succinct way, thanking him for his input that we have discussed it at the golf committee. We will take this up when we discuss dues and membership in the fall and presented to the selectmen, period. Okay, thank you. I, I would need a second. A second on Martha's motion. Uh, Paul, is that affirmative? Second. Okay, any discussion? Uh, John, John Crook. Uh, my only discussion would be that it's fine sending this from the golf committee, but I don't want to, we shouldn't overlap what Roman is going to do as well. I think Roman has been assigned from the Board of Selectmen to respond to this individual or this family. <laughs> and uh, we should have responded. I've already responded three separate times to them uh, based on the Selectmen's request. So I, I have responded to them. Uh, their, their, uh, their final request from a response from me was, uh, more than three weeks ago. So I've exhausted, you know, they've exhausted my responses already. And now the conversations are going on, I think, without notifying me. So 
Okay. Um, there's there's no there's no need for me to respond further. So you feel that we should send something from the golf committee? I think it'd be a good idea because I, I believe I, if I got you right, Clem, Larry Ballantyne asked you to have a response. Well, yeah, he 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 really was confident that we had uh, the ability to respond, and that if you think about it, folks, uh, there's a chain of command, and this individual right. has chosen time and time again to circumvent access to the committee. Now, Jack, if he's a if you've talked to this individual, you know unilaterally, that's fine, but uh, nothing formally has come to this committee not through the chair as of today. Other comments, uh, Steve Bellotta. I agree with, with the comments from others and I think it's fine if it comes from the committee, we make it short and sweet. We absolutely invite this, these individuals to attend the public meeting that we have in the fall on rates and fees and talking about tea times, et cetera. He or she or the whole family is welcome to come and make their comments. The one caveat I would make to all of this, and I don't know if we necessarily need to put it in the letter, but to Martha's earlier point, we have talked multiple times as a committee about this rate structure for Chatham versus, versus other towns. And we have made recommendations and we're moving forward. And as Martha put it, we make our recommendation and then it goes to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Selectmen decide to do whatever they're going to do. There's still this tremendous lack of transparency where if we've made a recommendation and the Board of Selectmen choose not to follow that recommendation, I believe quite strongly that we owe it to all of the taxpayers and certainly all of the members to be able to say we've made this recommendation and this recommendation was not approved by the Board of Selectmen. So then if these, this family wants to write letters to the Board of Selectmen, they could write letters saying, why aren't you following the recommendations of the Golf Committee? And, and that, that total lack of transparency of us deciding on something or recommending something, and then it falls into the black hole of going to the Selectmen's meeting and not being followed, and we get no reason why. And we can't, and when, when queried, we can't respond if people ask us, why didn't this happen? We don't know. And okay, that's uh, not, that's hey, not Clem, Clem, if I can, if I can uh, interject, I think yeah. that the, the selectmen accepted the committee's recommendation last year. You and I presented it, and then the selectmen's recommendation was for a $25 increase, or the committee's recommendation was for a $25 increase, and it was accepted uh, last year. I know in previous years there's been other conversations, but Last year, they did accept our recommendation. Thank you, uh, Roman. And uh, Martha, to your point, uh, let's make this a collaborative affair. Uh, I will uh, author a, a rough draft, and with your collaborative input, uh, we'll, we'll put something together, circulate it to the committee, and uh, with everyone's approval, uh, you know, we'll then uh, mail it to the appropriate parties. So uh, the motion is on the floor. It's been seconded. If there's any other discussion, could I call for a vote? All in favor of Martha's uh, motion? Aye. Signal by aye. Aye. Any abstention? Aye. Thank you. It's unanimous. And uh, Martha, uh, you know, we'll be in touch and we'll get that done uh, within the next few days, okay? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, Clem, Clem, if I can just uh, ask you a question. I provided yeah. a lot of uh, uh, data uh, regarding Chatham memberships. This right. could all be pushed forward to the fall when we do the discussion, or would you like to review any of that now? Uh, I, th I think that it's more appropriate this fall, Roman. Uh, you've given this uh, an inordinate amount of time, and I, 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 think, it's, I, I think that uh, Larry Ballantyne had a good suggestion, Roman that uh, you could post that information for preview uh, on the town website. And uh, that way for, for informed individuals, you know, they can access that, look at it in advance. How does that sound? Yeah, so the, just so the committee knows, uh, I, I submitted my monthly report to the selectmen last night and they, their comment was it, was, it was all regarding tea times and a lot of it was um, the slides I showed 
uh, during the um, 10 minute tea time presentation showing how our revenue is and how the uh, um, distribution of tea times is this year compared to last year. And they asked that, that they asked the town administrator that those slides and my monthly report be put on the town's website. So uh, that was all discussed at the Cyclones meeting last night. And that, that's fine, Clem. I'll save the data for uh, the fall rates and fees discussion. Yeah, I, uh, I hope that meets everybody's needs. Uh, I'd like to move on. To, I just think uh, that the I just think that the uh, discussion that we have with Chatham rates and fees. Hopefully, we'll do that in person and not do it out over this uh, Zoom concept. I know it's this, uh, is, very, this is very frustrating. Uh, it's frustrating. I I totally agree. Uh, maybe something magical will happen where uh, the selectmen will reverse course and allow us, you know, to meet in person. My question is, why can the selectmen meet in person and the committees can't? I, I am quite certain that it boils down to the uh, maintenance and sanitizing of the rooms, uh, the fact that they can't guarantee, uh, you know, uh, indirect involvement by, you know, the average public. Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I'm, I'm betting that it, it boils down to something uh, uh, close to that. Uh, if we can move on, uh, item number four, uh, budget goals and uh, COVID implications. Obviously COVID has had a profound uh, influence on our budget uh, activity this year. And I, I sent you a summary of a request that uh, was uh, asked for by Roman uh, to pare back uh, you know, our spending uh, uh, in the coming year, and uh, I'll have Roman take over. Rome? Yeah, okay, so, um, oh, sorry, I missed that slide there. I'm trying to see how to go back to it. In general, um, because the town had declared a financial crisis for this year, uh, they were having a shortfall at one point of over $4 million. And then that, once again, every time they discuss it, they discuss golf and overperforming uh, as, as helping to reduce those, those numbers. Um, uh, all, all departments were asked to cut our budgets as much as we possibly could. I picked a few line items that historically we were not uh, utilizing in full. So I, I found, I think it was about $16,000 in cuts. Um, and the last night the town, at the town selections meeting, they were discussing for the first time a balanced budget for this upcoming year. So um, the one thing that came out of it that um, I'm sure the committee won't be happy to hear is that um, the finance director discussed with me the opportunity for golf to use its dedicated funds to pay a portion of its debt for this year to help the town balance its budget. They're asking the waterways department to do it as well as, as well as other departments. And so I, the discussion's gone nowhere beyond that, other than the selectmen approved of the idea. Uh, there's been no number given to me yet, but um, you know we were being tasked as a town department to help balance a town budget. And so that, that is on the table currently. Um, where we stand currently with the budgetary process is very frustrating that our FY21 budget has not yet been approved because there's been no town meeting yet. So uh, we're operating the golf department with a very reduced budget at this point. Um, there's the 1 12th uh, budget process, which you, you may have read in the newspaper, where each department's given basically a 12th of their annual budget to utilize until town meeting approves the full annual budget, which again may be reduced by the finance committee. This stuff's all happening over the next few weeks. Um, it's been a really difficult process. The way I'm operating is the same as I operated in the previous fiscal year, which is you know, essential spending only. I, uh, the, um, um, the budget is so fluid and it's so bare bones at this point that I can't justify um, implementing large programs or large spending when we're only given a monthly budget. So we're, we're basically operating with essential spending at this point, pending town meetings approval of our budget. And when it gets approved, I think what they were discussing last night is a full budget as we, we originally requested in the in the in March. Um, so if that's the case, um, the golf department will be absolutely fine. We'll be able to re-engage all the programs we've currently had or we've previously had, but uh, we're in a difficult time right now with the 112th monthly budget. Thank you, Roman. Uh, comments, people? Uh, Jack Conley? Uh, 
when this COVID self um, started, you mentioned that a number of the um, positions were being were reimbursable, like the guard at the gate and a couple of others, the rangers. Has that money made its way into our, our budget? Uh, so we we basically file a um, separate payroll for those positions, Jack, and they they don't they don't affect our budget at all. So they're they're going directly to the CARES Act. So those are reimbursable and they're not negatively affecting us. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay, Roman, I think that uh, uh, covers the topic. Uh, uh, Chris, um, did you want me to show any of these uh, FY20 finances? I don't, I don't think I ever presented these. I can roll through them pretty quick because I know we're up against it time-wise. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that would be appropriate. Thank you. Um, really fast, the slide that we're currently on shows you know, our historical performance. What you'll see on this is due to the closure, um, due to COVID and as well as the tornado once again, um, greens fees, car fees were significantly down. Membership, once again, it, it, because we value membership very highly, you know, whether the golf course is closed or not, that money comes in. So that, that's, that was a strong, strong performer. And our overall revenue for the year was $1.519 $1 million, which, yeah. again, exceeded expectations. Um, I'll show the next slide where it comes up against expenses. So... Um, this shows both uh, revenue and expenses. So once again, even with that re reduced revenue, um, we covered our expenses, not quite to the same margin we normally do, but you know, it, it was quite a task to do it because once again, the finance department and the finance director did not think we would achieve that. I, I, think, I think it's kudos to the golf department that we once again covered our finance, uh, covered our expenses. Exactly. And, the, and that's the, oh, and the uh, end result, Roman, is the uh, uh, a plus 200,000 roughly? Yeah, roughly, yeah. And so, you know, that, that and again, I don't want to take a ton of credit or give a ton of credit to our department only. That was force fed to us by the selectmen with essential spending guidelines, uh, essential hiring guidelines. That's the reason that, that our, um, that, you know, you'll see our capital outlay number was so low, we had a, a freeze put on it. We would have spent it if we could have spent it. It, it was frozen. And um, so that's that's the reason that, that the expenses came in so low was uh, the selectmen dictated it, and um, it obviously showed results. And, uh, Roman, just a point of clarification, because I, I, I tried to emphasize that with Jack. Uh, when you talk about salary and wages, that does include all fringes, correct? No, it does not. Oh, it doesn't. No loadings. No loadings. Does not. So when we get into that number I mentioned earlier, Clem, of about 2.1 million, that oh. covers our, our our golf course debt as well as post post employment retirement benefits as well as um um uh, health insurance. All the all departments are covered in that separately of their operating budget. The, I got the, you. Only, yeah. only the enterprise funds pay that as part of their operating budget. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Next. Roman, can I, I just ask one question? Yes. Capital outlay is not depreciation. It is capital expenditures. Is that correct? That's correct. What, what we have in that line item each year uh, is, is for T renovation, car path work, and then we have yeah. a, a general placeholder for um, our intermunicipal inter agreement that we have with the two other towns to assist in airification and equipment for that. So that's generally the the, um, the money that we use for our annual T renovation, bunker renovation, and um, and tree renovation, um, or, or tree mitigation. But um, it's also the line item that I've always explained is so critical that when the pump house goes down, that's where we get the money for the expenses that come up un unbudgeted. But it's not the money that's coming out of the golf improvement fund. Is that correct? That's, this this is all operating budget money. That's capital outlay as part of our operating budget, not golf improvement. Okay. And does golf improvement fund make its way into this in, in any way? It's, it, it goes on a whole separate wing of finances, so it's, it's not represented in any way in this chart. Okay. 
Okay, is that it, Ron? Um, yeah. I can't see my next slide, so let me see if I have one. No, that's it. Okay, very good. Uh, all right. Uh, <clears throat> Now we get to item number five. A couple of budget questions, Clem. You can't just move on with those. I, I didn't, sorry, Steve, I didn't realize you had a, had a question. Yes. Go um, ahead. A couple of questions. Number one, does the relief that we got from the state or the federal government for the, for the um, tornado and or the, uh, the virus, does that get included as? as revenue if we're trying to see how we're doing on on cost versus revenue? That's Steve, you know, I, I argued with the, uh, I didn't argue very hard, but I, I did argue the points of the town administrator and the um, finance director when the money came in for tornado relief and uh, off the top of my head, I'm thinking it was $55,000 or $70,000. I argued that um, that check should be run through our register as greens fees, car fees, because that's it, that's what it was submitted as um, it, yep. to the insurance company as lost revenue. It was not. So it, that never that never hit our our books particularly. Okay. And then the other question I would have is I going back to your previous slide. I understand that that the the salary expense is not the fully loaded expense. It doesn't include benefits, et cetera, et cetera. But and 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 I understand that that gets paid out of a separate bucket or whatever the case may be, but I'm quite certain that the finance manager must have an idea of the approximate percentage of what that cost burden is that you would apply on top of salaries for a fully loaded expense for employees. Can we get that number from them? I mean, I've seen it in different companies I've worked, I've seen it range anywhere from a low of 12 to a high of 30, 31%, but- I'm sure, I'm sure we can. I'm, I'm sure, sure I'm I think sure the last- have a single percentage. So I provided that, I can't remember when it was, I think it was at some point over the winter that I provided the, the fully loaded um, expenses in total that included our debt and included the post-employment post retirement, retirement benefits and insurance benefits, but not particularly all broken down to the employee side. I have not seen a report like that, um, but I'm, I'm sure that she can provide it. And then we could just use that percentage so that we could get a better grasp in our own minds on how we're doing on revenue versus total cost to see if we're hopefully at least breaking even or, or a cost burden to the town. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, again, I think I, I know that you guys have concerns with other members among the town. I think it's, it's very well accepted that we are a cost center for the town and we are the cost center that covers the most of any other cost center for the town of our own budget. But um, it's, we're not expected to cover our entire um, Bill, this is, we're not an enterprise fund. That's yeah. why they don't. That's why they don't apply all those um, costs to our budget. It, it, um, it's not required. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Permission to move on, people. Topic number five: uh, the review of the Junior Mass Open Championship, and uh, all one had to do was uh, follow the newspaper stories. Uh, I'd like to commend uh, Jeff Converse for his coverage uh, of the tournament. Uh, I, I thought it was a highlight of the summer. So, uh, you know, Roman, if you just want to go through that quickly and then uh, anyone's comments, uh, I'd appreciate. Thank you. Absolutely. And well, once again, I mean, I, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that uh, John Crook it, it does run the tournaments for Mass Golf uh, as, as the chairman for the championships. So he oversaw the tournament uh, on his own. But uh, Mass Golf is wonderful to work with. It, you know, we have so many events at Cranberry Valley with Mass Golf that it, it's it's very easy. Um, Kevin Eldridge, who runs the events, knows the golf course inside and out. knows knows exactly where to stage things, where you know where to how to mark things. So it's a very easy relationship. They express that to me over and over that they love running events at our golf course. Um, and I think anybody that plays the golf course knows that's why golf, Cranberry Valley is so loved. You can show up there and not knowing the golf course, it's fairly open. 
it's player friendly. So it, it was it was a perfect event for uh, a venue for the event, and then we worked very well with Mass Golf. Um, so and that being said, you know it's so funny when we discuss the hurricane and the, I, we discuss the tornado and the uh, and the pandemic. Here comes this event we've had on the calendar for years, and here comes the hurricane. So we needed to activate a contingency plan. I, I, I imagine John was on some level involved in that, but I worked with Kevin Eldridge from Mass Golf to modify the, the plan for uh, in case there was a hurricane. And I think the plan was excellent because the participants were supposed to play two stroke play days, Monday and Tuesday. And because they would be such drastically different weather days, they decided to play them as individual days where each, each participant only played one day and they took the low eight from each day, which I thought was a great contingency plan. Kudos to Mass Golf for, for doing that because it really leveled the playing field. Um, on our side of things, uh, we filled all 26 volunteer needs for the, the Mass Golf asked us for, which was wonderful. Again, they were thrilled that, that we, our members stepped up to the plate, including three people I'm talking to right now, Steve Pallotta, Jack Conley, and Clem. I think all, all three, and then with John's involvement, John Crook's involvement as well, you guys were very involved in this tournament, so kudos to you as well for being involved. Um, the finances of an event like this are not great, but uh, there are finances. The, the Mass Golf paid us $1,200 for range use. $750 in gift certificates for the winners, and over $2,000 went to Ron for food. Um, well, the main thing, we received great press. People went back to all their corners of the state commenting on how much they loved Cranberry Valley, and we really made an investment in uh, getting the word out there about Cranberry Valley and in junior golf in general. So um, highlight of the summer, absolutely. And uh, Roman, I'd just like to call on Steve and Jack and uh, John for one anecdotal, please, because uh, – you know, I thought it was great you guys were available. Steve? Sure. I thought it was just a wonderful event. They were, the, the group I had, they were two very, very nice young men and men. And uh, it was my pleasure to, to, to walk the course with them and watch them play, <laughs> except I can't hit it nearly as far as they can. Uh, but uh, it was a great event and it encourages youth golf. I think it's fabulous all around. Yeah. Jack? Jack, your comments. All right. Yeah, I had a similar experience. I had, I think I had the, uh, the runner-up, um, Epstein. I think it was Mark Epstein was his name. And uh, they're both good kids. And um, it would be nice to be able to uh, hit it like they do now. But th those days are far, far gone. <laughs> and, John, thank you. John, uh, John. Any yeah, comments? I think Mass, Mass Golf was very happy with the relationship with Cranberry Valley. And I think that's evident by the number of events that we've had at Cranberry Valley. Uh, kudos to Roman and his staff and also Sean for getting all the operations in, in order. And that was uh, very positive. And I think the other thing that uh, Roman had mentioned was that the volunteers worked out very well too, which added to the success of the tournament. So I think it was a very successful tournament. It's a big event for the juniors. Yeah. It's the junior amateur championship of Massachusetts. So you had a lot of good players there and I think the event went very well. John, thanks so much. I uh, again, appreciate everybody's efforts and, uh, especially you and your staff, uh, Roman, it was tremendous. Uh, Next, I'd, I'd just like to uh, uh, go down to the uh, review of, and this is a tough one, folks. Uh, and Roman, I want you to uh, address the committee with uh, something that uh, was approved at, at town meeting. Uh, and of course, it gets mixed reviews, but the town's capital plan, the reason why it's in, uh, incumbent upon us as a committee to review this completely is because we have to set priorities and because of action of town meeting, once we create these priorities, uh, Roman, and you can amplify on this, we're going to be locked into people. It, it sounds incredible, but a seven year program that we will not have ownership of in a sense. Uh, Roman, I'll turn it over to you. 
Yeah, I, I can't give the entire background, Clem, on, on where this came from. I, I think Carol, the finance director, mentioned to me yesterday that uh, this was a bylaw that was um, pushed for by the finance committee. It went to the it went to ballot, and so it was voted on, and then it was approved at last year's town meeting. I know anybody that goes to town meeting, this has been a big thing that Leo Cocoon is, uh hypes on every single year that we have a capital budget but not a capital plan, and so they have they approved. Um, the implementation of a capital plan, a seven-year capital plan, where once items are put on that plan, they're set in stone uh, without a two-thirds vote at a town meeting to remove them or move them. So um, it, it, it's much less flexible than we've had in the past. The selectmen are currently arguing, and I have, have not gotten an answer on this yet, whether this is to be implemented immediately or this is the year that we review our capital plans. But I've told the the, the, the um, finance committee, the finance director, and the town administrator is because we were asked to pull our articles from this year's town meeting because they didn't reach, reach the essential guidelines um, uh, that we wanted to, or that I was going to recommend as a committee that we review all items on that capital plan and prepare, re re reorganize it, or at least review it, reprioritize it, reorganize it. And I think it's very important we do it in, that we do it in the upcoming months because once this capital plan for seven years is implemented, each year at town meeting, all they're voting in is the seventh year. It's assumed that the previous six years are set in stone. So it's a difficult way to operate. It does not allow very much flexibility. And uh, it's out of our hands. This is this has been voted on in the, at the ballot. This has been implemented. It's a bylaw by the finance committee. So the only thing being argued by the selectmen, and they have not come to a conclusion on this. My feeling is that we're going to get one year to do this. I think we're going to get one year where where the fiscal year 20, or I guess it would be next year's town meeting, will set this in stone. So we need to have this set by next year's town meeting. Um, and so I, I, I recommend that this off season. We, re we thoroughly review what's on it and we reprioritize if we see the need to. And I do a financial review to show how this um, COVID crisis has affected our anticipated re revenue into our funds. And um, if the town's going to ask us to pay a portion of our debt this year, as, as was mentioned last night, that'll affect it as well. So we've got a lot of moving parts in this currently. Um, but that, that, that is the new mandate. Yeah. Uh, then, Roman, I. I would suggest, uh, and hopefully this would work for you, that maybe we set a goal to uh, <clears throat> engage in September and October and November and complete the review by November so that, uh, you, you know, you've got some kind of direction. And I, and I think it underscores, uh, correct me if you will, but uh, it underscores the fact that, uh, you know, this committee uh, is very much involved in decision making. And uh, this this is of primary importance because it's going to impact the next five years going out. Well, Clem, I, I appreciate that, and I I really want you know the committee to have discussion on this. And you 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 accompany Sean and I every year to the finance committee when we fight for these items. So I they want to hear that the golf committee endorses what's on this plan. So um, but I, I think it's been very beneficial to us that it's been fluid in the past. It's going to be very restrictive that it's not, but that's the, that's the new playing field. So I think I think it'd be a gift, considering that that we have one off season to to really set it the way we wanted to. And what's currently on there is not just getting set in stone on its own. We 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 have a few months to uh, or half a year to set it the way we wanted to before it's set in stone. So it's going to require a financial review, and I'll, I'll um you know definitely. Ask for you know a creative brainstorming session. Let you know let's let's come up with what's not on here that we may need in seven years. I know I've talked to Clem, Sean. We one thing that's not on here whatsoever is a generator, a backup generator for the golf course. So um you know we've we've tried pricing those out. I've got a um, quote from Sean Libby that a that a um a generator that would operate the golf course uh, irrigation system um for an extended period of time if needed would cost about a quarter million dollars they just did one at the um at the library for 130,000 so and the one at the library Sean Libby thought was just about half of our need so well he, he's looking into that for us to get a more free, real number but um I think that when we start looking at I think especially in the financial crisis we're currently in I think we our, our plan would be overly scrutinized and maybe should be if we're looking too much into 
designing the three-hole practice facility and putting course when we're not also looking at infrastructure needs. Because uh, they're very quickly a question can come to that design um, and say, that's going to just cost money and not generate money, whereas it doesn't generate value. So I, I think I think in the current environment that's uh, so um, money conscious, um, infrastructure needs may be a higher priority, and I, I think they should be. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, in our discussion in the post tornado uh, event and so on, I, I know that we did reference, uh, you know, the enormous need for uh, generation. Uh, capabilities because, uh, to my knowledge, we're about the only uh, uh, department in town that does not have that kind of reliance. I, I'm pretty certain that highway and uh, even harbors and waterways, you know, has some infrastructure built in. So I, uh, you know, I, I can't believe it's a quarter million dollars, but if we have to bite the bullet, we have to bite the bullet. Uh, it'd be a topic that would be, uh, uh, companion people to uh, uh, engagement with our Green Skies uh, outfit as well. Uh, they may have some inside track, Roman. You never know regarding uh, you know generation equipment. Jack, we've I see your hand up. We've, Clem, we've talked to them a bunch in the past about um, you know battery packs, and it sounds as far as the electric goes, and it's cost yeah. prohibitive at this point. You never know if the technology is going to move forward, but as far as ba battery pack system. Attached yeah. the solar. They said that was cost prohibitive. Gotcha, Jack. Yeah. Well, and I assume, and, and I, I don't know what's, that most of this money on this list that you have is is intended to be funded through the golf improvement fund. Is that the case? So if you see it, uh, you know the items on it that are marked GIF. Those are, those are golf improvement fund, and then budget is the line item you just asked me about. Um, Jack, that's the um, capital outlays line item in our budget. So you include capital expenditures in your budget as well as the golf improvement fund. Is that correct? Uh, so, um, um, so you remember you just asked me a moment ago about the capital outlays rec yeah. representation. So that's that that's seventy three thousand we've had each year. The um, projects, the, the big projects we're doing out of that are represented here on the capital request plan. So if it says budget, that's out of that line item in our budget. The ones that are marked GIF are from the Golf Improvement Fund completely separately. Okay, and we could have a, a commensurate realization of how much is actually left in the Golf Improvement Fund, how much we anticipate putting in each year and see how it jives up because conceivably you might be able to take some of that money out of your budget if if we can do that correlation. Yes, absolutely. So I mean when we when we as a committee built this last year, I did all those I did all those presentations of exactly this this um capital request uh sheet right here uh was formed at our committee last fall based on anticipated revenues. And that, that's one of the reasons I wanted to um, step back and review just to see where you know where the revenues are based on the closures we've had in the past year, but um, and see how they affect them. But based on the, the, everything on this list was to be funded by golf improvement fund or budget entirely. Right, but does it does it completely consume the uh, golf improvement fund? I think we're, we're taking seventy five dollars a person for the so, golf improvement fund. Is that correct? Currently, it's 95. That was boosted up last year to 95. And uh, okay. so, you know, I, I, can't, I don't have those numbers in front of me, Jack, but in general, if you look at this capital request form, um, we were going light for a few years here uh, to build up enough money to um, do the um, T renovation in FY21, I'm sorry, FY25 and 26, because those are about 150,000 each year for two years. Uh, we okay. needed to build, build, build a little revenue in that to t tackle that big project. And then, you know, once again, as far as infrastructure needs, the irrigation upgrade that we discussed last fall putting on here, um, Sean can break that down a number of different ways. And we've, we've got to really scrutinize that when we put this together because um, that we had that on there for beginning in FY22 and going for seven years, I believe, at $75,000. So that, that's one of those that we can chunk out however we want to chunk it out. Sean can basically do a leg at a time and a leg – in a lot of cases, average is about two holes. So you can kind of do two holes at a time the way he's got it um, 
um, chunked out there, but we can review all this. I, I recommend we review all this. They said 1,100 members. We're probably averaging 100,000, $110,000 a year. In, in yes. Fund. I, I think it's right around 100, Jack. No, oh, right 100, okay. John Crook, you had a comment? No, I did. Okay, uh, anybody else? Okay, Roman, we'll uh, look forward to a, a, a phase one uh, of review for uh, the September meeting, okay? Great. Uh, and that uh, uh, takes us to item number seven under new business. Uh, the last item, the USGA visit and uh, the status of the visit. Uh, as I uh, indicated uh, to the group, and uh, sorry about the short notice, but it was short notice. The good news is that it's going to be included. Uh, it's this Friday. It's 8.30. Uh, because of COVID uh, protocols, requirements, et cetera, I, I think it's uh, incumbent to limit it to the committee only. In the past, we've invited members of the uh, select board uh, to come and uh, other interested parties, but uh, it just, it, it really isn't feasible at this time. I think the important thing is the information that we garner from the visit, uh, we can certainly promote and share on our website. So, uh, any questions about the visit? All right, uh, I'd suggest, uh, by the way, that, you know, we get there uh, in timely fashion so that uh, the timetable starting at 8.30 can be uh, adhered to closely. And uh, I'm coming with a note. Um, we normally hop in carts together. Once yeah. again, please remember we've got to be in individual carts. So I'll have a bunch of carts staged for us. Everybody's going to ride their own carts, seeing as nobody on the committee lives together. So individual carts on Friday, please. <laughs> and okay, thank you, Roman. Uh, and that is important to uh, uh, you know take note of. Uh, and finally, uh, under old business. It's a carryover from uh, a discussion uh, at our last meeting. And uh, uh, basically it's uh, a draft of a letter that's been uh, uh, kind of condensed uh, with uh, uh, John Crook's approval uh, in, a, in a possible vote if you uh, choose to send this on to uh, Mr. Ballantyne. Everybody has a copy of the letter. Uh, I'd open it up for discussion. Uh, if if you're uh, so disposed. So regarding uh, the letter, it would uh, require a motion to uh, uh, send this letter on to uh, Mr. Ballantyne for consideration. Uh, so uh, discussion first and then a motion if, if you feel uh, so disposed. Anybody? I just, uh, we had the, we discussed this letter before and I thought it was appropriate. It was well stated. It's concise, gets to the point, and I, and, and I support it as, as it exists. Okay. And I think it should be sent to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, uh, John, I, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, in terms of uh, chain of command, uh, I think it's appropriate to uh, send it to uh, Mr. Ballantyne. And then uh, at his, discretion. Uh, he can share the, the content uh, with uh, the board uh, as required. Well, let me ask you a question, given that point. Should this, yep. go, to Ed Mc, should this go to Ed McManus? Uh, I, I think we can uh, copy that to Ed, but, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see it uh, directly sent to, uh, you know, the, the chairman of the board. Just responding to your chain of command comment. Okay. Uh, Jack, just a, a question. I mean, are the, are the challenges really action items we'd like to see taken? Uh, I think that I think it opens up the door uh, to discussion. You know, from the selectman's perspective, uh, Jack. So I, I would leave it at that. Okay. Any other comments? And uh, John Wheeler, that's, can I take that as a motion from you? 
Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. I need a second if uh, we want to continue this discussion. Uh, so, Martha, Martha Duffy, a second. Any other conversation about uh, uh, the letter content and or comments? Uh, John Crook. Need to unmute them. Sorry. Sorry, John. Go ahead. You're on, John. Still muted. There it is. I, I think since this letter has been uh, wordsmithed a few times, I think or uh, I think it has to be taken a look at in terms of I don't like the way it flows, but I mean I think it needs to be wordsmithed a little bit. Okay. Would but you I'm, like to? Uh, it's, it's basically the same thing, but yeah. I think it just has to be wordsmithed. Yeah, there was one area there that, uh, uh, you know, as far as controls are concerned, uh, you know, relative to the director, uh, if it's to everybody's satisfaction, John, I will, I can uh, collaborate with you. Uh, we'll get a final draft uh, circulated to the, to the members, to everyone's satisfaction, and then we can, uh, you know, send that off if, if that, if that resonates with you that's fine are you asking are you asking me to remove remove the uh on the motion uh no. such time that's been completed uh yeah no. i would i would say approve the motion and we're just going to wordsmith it a little bit and fine everybody, with me, john. everybody will see it before it goes fine with me john okay uh uh paul white um, first of all, um, this is my first meeting, so I, I have to rely on uh, past history and the experience of this committee. But as a new member, as I looked at this letter, I was a little bit concerned that it was, uh, well, to, to some extent, it's confrontational. Uh, and maybe that's necessary. I don't know. I just don't know the history the way you folks do. Um, but as an elected official, I would be a little bit put off. Uh, if, if I thought folks were telling me how to do my job. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I'd, I'd like to know, you know, what has contributed to, to this moment. Because as, as John Crook has said, apparently this letter has been worked on for a while and it's been wordsmith. But I feel an obligation to at least share my freshman reaction to this. And if it's unwarranted, I respect that. But I, I, I wanted to at least raise that point. Paul, thank you for that input. Any other uh, concerns or comments? Okay, the motion on the floor uh, uh, presented by Mr. Wheeler, uh, John Wheeler, and seconded by Martha Duffy, correct? Martha, that's a second from you. Uh, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it's unanimous, and uh, we'll get that final draft in everyone's hands. Uh, John, thanks for that input, and you know, in general, everybody's input. Uh, we covered a lot of ground tonight. Uh, it's 6:02, and uh, thanks to our friends in the clerk's office, uh, we had electronically the platform that the fire uh, safety people have dedicated to them. So we had a green light to uh, go over the time allocated actually. So uh, uh, kudos to our uh, help from the clerk's office. Uh, a motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. Unless, any new business? Okay. So moved by Paul White. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks everyone. Good night. Thank you, Roman. Roman, night. thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. -bye. This con. Okay.